as, uh, as Sue said, I'm an HHMI professor, and the HHMI professors are chosen for the leadership qualities that HHMI is looking for, but also there's a particular project that you pitch, a particular class and in innovative teaching uh, program that you want to do. And I, I am about to give you uh, the laziest presentation that you've ever seen because the students in my class have created what I'm going to show you as my talk today. Uh, so I'm going to give you this much information to say that my research field is circadian biology. I teach a 300 student class in circadian biology. There are no good teaching materials for circadian biology, especially at the undergraduate level. And uh, therefore, my class uh, is focused on teams of students making multimedia interactive materials for this 300 student class and then also for public outreach. One of those items that they've been making uh, is a documentary of the class. And, uh, and very conveniently for me, uh, uh, Victoria Nudell, who is one of the students working on the documentary, uh, finished her first segment four or five days ago. And uh, in fact, that's what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to let the BioClock Studio tell you about the BioClock Studio. And then I will um, answer your questions. Uh, this is not coming up. Hang on a moment. I had everything all queued up, of course, and now it's not there. I'm Susan Golden, and I'm a distinguished professor at UC San Diego in Sorry. the Division of Biological Sciences. I'm also the Sorry, director people, of the Center for Circadian start Biology, it worked which perfectly is earlier. the field in which I do my own research. I'm also the creator of the BioClex Studio. Okay, you ready to do something? There you go. Okay. Camera's rolling. Hello everyone, my name is Jared Kim. I'm a human biology major undergraduate at UC San Diego and part of the BioClock Studio Winter 2016. I'm Susan Golden and I'm a distinguished professor at UC San Diego in the Division of Biological Sciences. I'm also the director of the Center for Circadian Biology, which is a field in which I do my own research. I'm also the creator of the BioClock Studio. So the BioClock Studio is an unusual class that was made possible by a grant from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute when I was named an HHMI professor. I was fortunate to get such a grant and to be able to put together this really unusual and, um, I don't know, wildly creative, I think, a uh, class where students can combine science and communication and art and find ways to communicate biology to other students. The BioClock Studio actually draws on expertise from a lot of other individuals here at UC San Diego, not just uh, myself as a researcher, uh, but also other faculty and postdoctoral scientists and graduate students who are uh, researchers in other circadian biology laboratories and also uh, undergraduate students who work in those labs or have taken a class in circadian biology and participate directly in the course. The thing that makes this class so special, well there are really several things that make this class so special, but one of them is that the projects that students are working on in the BioClock Studio have a real purpose, and that purpose is to make learning science, and specifically circadian biology, but uh, to make learning science easier for other students and for the public. What this means is that what all the students who are participating in BioClock Studio, the things they're doing are not things they're doing just for a grade. It's, they're not just going to do a report, someone grades it and puts it in a drawer. Instead, the students are uh, learning new skills and learning new science, but they're using that to make something that's going to be published, something that's going to be made publicly available and will help other people learn concepts in biology in a way that is approachable and fun and interesting. I guess the 
part of the real stimulus for creating the BioClock Studio was frustration at teaching a class that should be very, very interesting on a topic that students are very excited about and that should be very engaging, but being frustrated that the educational materials available were really not appropriate, that there were very dense writings by scientists for other scientists. There's popular information in the press that is so watered down that you, the science isn't there anymore. And what was really missing was something in between. And so initially that was really the idea, was just to, um, to be able to find and make materials that are appropriate for our undergraduate audience. But beyond that, this is also an opportunity to change the way that we teach this class and other classes in a, more generally, and that is to get away from lectures, to start uh, taking advantage of the technologies that are available now for multimedia educational experiences and make learning more fun. The really great thing about the BioClock Studio is that the impacts of this course can be tremendous. We have students learning to work collaboratively, which is an a very useful skill, very important for training the students who are taking the class and for them to go out and have a better skill set when they leave. And that's something that they may not get in many of their other classes. Uh, it also lets scientists realize that arts and communication are important. It lets people who work in arts and communication realize that they can, in fact, learn from others who are experts in the science uh, what they need to know so that they can act, help to portray that information. The BioClock Studio is a small class. It's, uh, we feel that we can have up to 20 students. So far we've had 15. For these 15 students, we have three to five instructors who are working with the students. And this means that when the students are divided into teams to work on particular projects, they can have a knowledgeable, experienced person working with them at a ratio of one instructor to maybe two to four students. I usually am in charge of a team myself, and the junior instructors are each in charge of some team where that instructor has the appropriate scientific knowledge and some other skills for whatever the type of project is that makes them suit particularly suitable for that team. I have been involved as a junior instructor of my Plot Studio since its inception uh, two years ago in the winter of 2015 and prior. So um, with my expertise in the circadian rhythm both the metal system and set of bacteria so and also interested in teaching uh, undergraduate students, so make me a, a good opportunity for me to have helping, assisting Dr. Susan Golden. There are junior instructors who are involved in the class who are graduate students or postdoctoral scientists who are getting an opportunity to do hands-on learning, mentoring, and education that's different than the experience they get mentoring a student in the lab at doing research and different than the experience they have standing up and lecturing in front of the class. The instructor is not really telling the students what to do, but always being there as a resource person to help guide the conversation, to help provide structure, and to ensure that the science is accurate, that the timeline is appropriate, that the scope of the project is appropriate, and to help determine what resources are needed to pull it off. One of the most important features that we have to draw on here at UC San Diego is that we do have this very large Center for Circadian Biology where we have approximately three dozen laboratories that are all working in some area of circadian biology. And that means not only that there are researchers that are available, but also that the uh, postdocs and the graduate students who work with them, undergraduate students work in their lab. Uh, many of them help teach in the class, of, the circadian biology class that we offer. 
It means that when we want to do an in-lab video on how do you conduct a wheel running experiment in rodents, we have great laboratories to go to that do that kind of research all the time and where there are uh, researchers who can explain how the experiments are done and can show what the uh, equipment looks like, how what the analytical tools are, and um, we have the, we have the props, we have the um, we have the sets that we need for our videos, and that's also very important. A really important resource is that we do have this group of 300 students every fall that can tell us how we're doing, and they can tell us what we're not doing well and what we need to do better. They can also tell us how enthusiastic they are about this field and how excited they get about particular topics. And all of that information is critically important for deciding what the BioClock Studio will do, what those projects should be, and what kinds of media we need to use to present the information. We get to explain the things that a textbook or a review article can't explain. How do you do these experiments in the lab? What does that look like? Um, and if you're trying to figure out how a process works, and this is a process that involves proteins, and you're trying to imagine in your head from this series of events, how does that happen? Instead, you have an animation and show, well, this is how it happens. And in, in all of those ways, I think that the BioClock Studio is letting us um, do something really different. I, th I think that Victoria and Pagapol told you about it much better than I could have. Uh, what I want to do now uh, is just uh, spend a few minutes showing you some of the materials uh, that have been created through the BioClock Studio. And uh, the, the students do work on projects. They work on projects that each fall, uh, at, when this 300 student course is taught, which will start Monday, and we'll be deploying the materials that I'm about to show you, uh, flipping more of the classes uh, this quarter uh, than we were able to do last year. Uh, the students will work on these projects. The projects do have to be wrangled. The, during the winter quarter, they work on projects that we determined in the fall quarter are needed for the next fall quarter. And uh, the uh, projects are, uh, the students work very hard on them. They usually get them 85% mm, of the way done, and then the junior instructors work with a few students who are willing to continue to work during the class year, uh, during the academic year, and even during the summer to get them wrapped up. And so I'm um, I'm very excited that we have just uh, we've just deployed a lot of new materials. This particular one that, uh, that I think my screen resolution isn't quite right here. Um, uh, this particular one is uh, providing a text that um, is appropriate for students, so there are no textbooks. The review articles that we were able to use in the past were too complicated. We now have a, a, an intro that describes the purpose and how the BioClock Studio students were involved, and also a, a, it will send people to a feedback form so that we can know what we need to change. It ha it's a three-part introduction to chronobiology or, or biological timing that then has pop-ups that can explain additional information and also has links to the tutorials that have been created by the BioClock Studio so that as you're reading along, you can, um, you can go and see a, a, go and view a video that will explain the concept in more detail. I'm trying to find you a couple more here. Uh, the other thing is that there are pop-ups as students come to particular terms, there are pop-ups then that will define that term for them. And this is actually an intermediate um, fix before another BioClock Studio project, which is a project called Chronopedia, which is, a, um, which is an interactive vocabulary Wikipedia for biological timing terms that also then has illustrations and links, you know, it, multimedia and links out to various, uh, various forms. And we, we should be able to deploy Chronopedia, I think, by the next year. And then I also want to show you uh, something that you already saw in the documentary, which is that everything that we make is publicly available, either on a website or all the videos go up to, uh, go onto YouTube. And in fact, the university likes that. They like the fact that they can just link on the website and, and, and pull it out from YouTube. Uh, but in particular, uh, what have been created are a, a series of tutorials on various topics. In this and, video, um, you're going to learn about what's actually, I wanted to 
one of the ones that's new, is on using luciferase in reporter genes. We find out that students really don't get the reporter gene thing. And so every year we've tried to get that right, and Hello, I think that we're much closer now. Hello, my name is Takako, and I'm a researcher and an instructor of the BioClock Studio at UC San Diego. Today we are in the Goldman Lab, where I will show you how we study circadian rhythms in neurons using a bioluminescence reporter. Okay, so now I... Uh, in this okay. video, you're going to... Oops. Okay. And in addition, though, not everything is a tutorial. This is the problem with uh, YouTube. Okay. Uh, in addition to the tutorials, then, we, we also have interviews with scientists. And um, this, again, takes advantage of the fact that, um, that UC San Diego has this big center for circadian biology, and we have an annual symposium that brings in some of the top people in the field. And uh, so we, in fact, have uh, a couple of the students from BioClock Studio, their project will be an interview with a professional film crew uh, of a scientist who's attending the conference so that we can give uh, so that we can give people and give students a, um, a better view of, um, of who... Hi, my name is Lucy Wu, and Sorry, I'm, I'm a second year at UC San Diego. My major is human biology, and I'm here with Dr. Katema Paul as part of BioClock Studio's interview crew to interview him about his work at Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, there it is. Okay. Sorry about that, Pagapol. I'm sure I'm driving him crazy. because Georgia are, State uh, was an accident. I had no intention of going to Georgia State University. So I'd like to say here that the feedback that we get from the students is that the, the single most important uh, part of the project uh, of being involved with BioClock Studio is that they're integrated into this symposium that we give every, that we hold every February. They had no idea that scientists were normal. And uh, so, and, and I should say that the bio, because they're part of the BioClock Studio and the BioClock Studio helps to sponsor this conference, the students don't just go and attend. They are actually, part sponsors of the meeting, and so each of them has some kind of a role so that they're really engaged in the meeting. And um, they were just totally blown away that, that scientists were interesting to talk to and that they were regular people. And um, so anyway, I think that's, that's one of the very valuable things. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then one of the things that you saw a little bit from are, uh, are then these uh, in-lab videos. And here the idea is Hi, that I'm Deborah, and I'm a researcher at UCSD, and the purposes of these videos... Okay, you already saw a little bit from that one uh, during the documentary. Our th the 300 students that we're teaching in our big class are, um, first of all, they're being asked to imagine how experiments are done. Many of them may work in a lab, but, certain, but maybe not a lab that does this kind of work. Probably not a lab that does this kind of work. But a lot of them really won't even have an opportunity to work in a lab. And I think it's really important to make that connection, let them know all of this stuff that's going on at the university, much of which is research that's really very separate than, from the idea of going to classes. And um, I really think that we're, uh, we're making a lot of progress in making these connections between the research community and the education community, and hopefully making a lot of the information come alive uh, for the students. Um, so that's really all I'm going to tell you now. The rest, uh, of, uh, the rest of the time I'd like to spend just answering any questions that you might have. Uh, but, uh, but you did, you did ha Sue had some specific questions that she wanted us to address about um, you know, what some of the hurdles are for other people trying to do this sort of thing. How would you implement it? I would have to say that um, I, I think that this, this particular kind of class and project is unusual because we're addressing the fact that we're teaching what many consider a boutique subject, although it's, it's so not. Absolutely all of biology is circadian. Everybody has just been blissfully unaware of it. And, um, <laughs> It's affecting all of your experiments, and uh, you really should know about it. But uh, aside from that, we're really trying to fill a knowledge gap where there, there's just not instructional material out there. Uh, it would, without a budget from HHMI, it would be very hard to do this. You really do have to work in small teams if you want students to make high production value uh, materials that are going to be uh, picked up elsewhere. So there are probably some aspects of it. I think the I, that that could, in fact, be uh, fairly easily replicated. I I think it's really good getting students who don't know the biology teamed with students who do know the biology, and um, and and sometimes the results then can be uh, can be quite remarkable. And um, 
I guess the other thing in terms of hurdles, uh, Sue already addressed one of those, which is that none of us know what the heck we're doing when we jump in to try to do some kind of creative education work. I think there's not enough uh, good communication uh, about best practices so that we don't reinvent wheels. Uh, HHMI is careful not to make it all about assessment, and they don't want, uh, they, they, uh, they're, not, they're not looking for uh, specifically science education experiment projects. They're looking to fund a person and get them very engaged uh, in a, scientific, a science education activity. But I still, I think I needed a little more help with assessment. And so I, I think that just uh, some kind of best, some easy ways to learn best practices, uh, a little bit of a boot camp. I, actually, that would be an outstanding idea, is a boot camp for people who, want, who really want to change the way they teach their class and not just get up there and lecture for 80 minutes at a time, as we've been doing in the past. Um, I think that kind of hit the specific questions you ask. And other than that, I'd be happy to answer any that you might have based on what you've seen. And I should also say that, uh, that one of the junior instructors you saw, uh, Pagapol, will be here giving a poster and not just a poster, but he also has an, an iPad that will be showing interactive stuff in the background. Uh, so anyway, be sure to go to his poster and you can learn a little more about that. Yeah. I was wondering what kind of support you had for all the technology. Sorry, my name is Robin Duncan. I'm from UCSC. Uh, the, uh, the technology support we've had is actually quite excellent from the organization at UCSD formerly known as ACMS, and I've, they've changed their name, and I can never remember what it is. Uh, it's, huh? ETS. ETS, Education Technology Services or something like that. And they, in fact, have um, course design. They have a course design mandate and vision, and, and even some budget. So we're, despite the fact that we have a budget, we are, we're somewhat subsidized because we're providing course materials and anything that comes under the category of what they're already doing, they're doing. But they have green screen technology. They have this wonderful thing called the learning glass that I can't wait to uh, find a way to use because it's something better than, than green screen. And, uh, and professional film crews and professional editing. And they'll really work with us to let us let the students be as involved as they want to be. So for a lot of the video editing, some of it, the students and junior instructors just did with Camtasia, and then, and even with that, they can they can get help and hints. The uh, you saw a little bit of an animation. The students and instructors uh, created the complete storyboard, and then a professional animator uh, through through that through ETS was in fact able to do the real animation and to make it make these little sounds so that things pop and it's just it's just fantastic. So we actually had a lot of help along those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Susan Strom from UCSC. Is the flow of student participation that they initially participate in the 300 student course and then 15 to 20 join the BioClock Studio to help create content for the next group of 300? Is that? That's a, that's a great question. Our goal is for it to be 50-50. And uh, the, to half of the students to have had the circadian biology class and half of the students to come from other majors. In fact, because our best recruiting avenue is from that class, it's been more than, it's, I don't know, it, it's been between a half and three quarters maybe that have taken the class. Uh, also, um, one of the other ways that we target students, we visit a communications class and uh, we also have uh, the cooperation of Sixth College at UCSD, which is a one of the undergraduate colleges has science, science, technology, and design as a theme. And there are students in that college that need to do a practicum, and they can count this class as their practicum. Mm -hmm. uh, John Matsui from UC Berkeley. I'm interested in the selection and training of your co-instructors. Uh, around group dynamics, collaboration, and also um, maybe uh, teaching to diversity. Right. The, um, this is where being, ha being the director of the Center for Circadian Biology has been very important because this is a field that people who work in it are passionate about, and the 
uh, the postdocs and trainees in the labs are not only passionate about it, but a lot of them are really pretty passionate about getting special teaching experience. And so there are more people who want to participate in this course than can. And, and what I have been doing is paying a portion of their salary. They're, they're not, they're not full-time on BioClock Studio, but they spend part of their time on that. Uh, and in terms of preparation, we're all kind of self-taught. So um, uh, everybody, uh, but again, we have good partners. So really, we're trying to find the people who know the best practices, and the instructor can help mediate, making sure that we're working with that. One of my partners in setting this up was also uh, Dac uh, Dr. Madeline Pichado, who was the director of the Writing Center at UCSD. She also had a lot of background in, um, in pedagogy, best practices for writing, learning outcomes, and she was helping to guide me. But we're flying by the seat of our pants. Preston Holt, oh, Joel Rothman, Santa Barbara. Uh, oh, hold. Uh, so uh, it's presumably pretty selective to get in here if you have 15 students and not even all of them are from biology. So, so what, what's your applicant pool and, and then how do you do the selections? And then secondarily, um, in what way are the 31 PIs involved in this? I mean, do, do the 31 PIs that are in chronobiology, are, are, you know, how much participation is there broadly? Okay, uh, so first of all, I think this is the year that we'll find out how, um, how the selection funnel will really work because it was kind of hard to get the word out early on. The first year we weren't a real class, we weren't in the schedule of class, I mean we were a, a, you know, a temporary class, uh, students were a little leery about it, uh, the, and so most of them did in fact come from our, they either came from our, our 200 student class and the brave ones from the 200 student class, or they had connections, and we've got also got some students from communications. So actually, we were undersubscribed the first year because the students were really very skittish about it. Uh, last year, we had an established class with a course number, uh, and we, um, but I think we, I can't remember, we, we did get in the schedule of classes, but students still didn't know what to do with it. This year, we have all these materials we have something to show. Students are going to understand what it is, and I think that we're. I think this is going to be the year that we're going to have. We're going to have a lot more applicants to sort through, and in and part of what we'll be looking for is, um, first of all, uh, we are looking for diversity, diversity of all kinds, diversity of skill sets and backgrounds, diversity, demographic uh, diversity, uh, ethnic diversity. We we want. We want to bring a lot of different um, skills and, uh, and approaches to this. So uh, we are looking to mix it up. And uh, I realize that's kind of a vague answer, but um, we're really trying to get a good mix. And when we know what our projects are going to be, we also know, you know, we really need some computer scientists. We're having, you know, the, here's a good computer scientist. That's somebody who can code, you know, that's something that we need. So actually, I wonder how you attract students outside biology into the course. What, what sort of promulgation method do you use, or how do you link with the other departments to ensure that they direct, you know, sort of point students in, toward this? So far, it's been kind of hard. Last year, we had, uh, we, ha we had uh, in terms of uh, going and visiting a class, and particularly there was a communications class that we had a good route to because of this sixth college where someone involved in that was teaching a communications class. And one of the students uh, got two of their friends to come, so so that was also one way to do it. But that's that's actually been, I think, the hard part is that I don't know who the right people are. But of course, I, I have had a lot of help and a lot of support from people in um, in the uh, in the various well, uh, the an associate dean for biology uh, who was in charge of education had a lot of contacts, and so she sent me to other people. But even so, it, it, it's hard to make those contacts. The design lab, I assume, has sort of been working through those same problems toward making the contacts, the design lab at UCSD. Um, probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and then the 31 PIs? The, the oh, yeah, yeah, that question. Uh, primarily, I would say they're involved in a few ways. Uh, one is that the, my co-instructor of, of the 300 student class is in psychology, and so he's one of those other PIs. Um, and uh, the student, the Postdocs and graduate students are, some of them are involved as instructors, and we go and film in the labs of these other PIs, and um, the, 
and also some of them get interviewed. So the other thing is that all of the students do a practice interview, even if their project is not going to be one of these high production value interviews, they they all have to do an interview with somebody local, and so we get participation from about a dozen people to do that. Kamal Dulai from UC Merced. Can you tell us any negatives that we've come across so far, please? Some. Uh, I would say that um, I, my, my criticism, I can give you my criticisms of the course. I think that we haven't provided enough uh, organizational structure, enough structure to use the students' time as well as we could so that when they're not actively in class, they're moving forward on things and, and, and developing timelines so that we can really make more progress. I think we're still trying to figure out how much can they get done and how can we get them to do more on their own. Um, and then. Uh, also, um, I'm still struggling a little with assessment. I'm gathering a lot of feedback from the students, but knowing what to do with that is a little more difficult. Although, because everything that we do goes up on the web and we have hit counters on everything, we can, in fact, find out, uh, find out if, in fact, people are using our materials. And so far, we have one thing that just went up, um, I don't know, a couple of months ago already has about 150 views, and we've already had a couple of people say, can I use this? Can I use this in my class? So that's one of the ways that we'll be assessing. Thank you. Thanks so much. So I think one of the things you're going to see today is the diversity of approaches. Um, and I, I really, I'm tr we're trying to have as much conversation as possible because given the diversity of, of experiences in this room, we really want to do it, uh, want to see a lot of conversation, but we also have lots of time and breaks and lunch and all of that. So. The, the point here is really to expose all of us to what is going on around the UCs. So in that vein, our next speaker is Brian Sato, who is an associate teaching professor at UC Irvine. And his, the title of his talk is Impact of Lecturer SOEs on STEM Teaching and Research. <laughs> 